Thank you all and welcome for uh, joining us this evening, uh, taking some time out of your, your busy schedule and learning a little bit about innovative treatments for hip and knee pain. I uh, did want to clarify a little bit from the introduction. Um, we've been hearing that introduction uh, for almost a decade now since I moved uh, to Boulder uh, in 2013. Uh, I am no longer Boulder and Longmont's only fellowship trained orthopedic surgeon, but I still am the first fellowship trained orthopedic surgeon uh, in hip and knee replacements. Uh, my uh, new young partner, Dr. Bowman, is also fellowship trained. Uh, and we've done nearly 5,000 joint replacements. And actually next week, uh, we'll pass 3,000 uh, hip and knee replacements with robotic assist. Uh, so uh, one of the highest uh, numbers in the country uh, and nationwide. It's something that we're proud of. Uh, like she said, I do work at the Boulder Center for Orthopedics um, and then the medical director of the Joint Replacement Program at Boulder Community Hospital. And that's all for this evening. Thank you for taking your time to have this discussion with us. Uh, we'll get this restarted here. There we go. Um, my path has taken me from uh, growing up in Montana, uh, going to a small college there. and playing football, uh, where I was a two-time academic All-American, out to uh, Seattle, Washington for medical school, uh, and down to Albuquerque, New Mexico for residency in orthopedic surgery, and then a fellowship in hip and knee replacements focused on advanced technologies and uh, specializing in robotics uh, at the Kuhn Joint Replacement Institute in St. Helena, California, um, at St. Helena Hospital. Uh, I was the, actually the, one of the first surgeons uh, in the country and actually the first specifically with uh, robotic joint replacement fellowship level training. Uh, and that then brought me here to uh, Boulder uh, to help with you folks. Uh, I have medical licenses in Colorado and Montana, um, and I am a consultant for Striker Robotics, uh, which means they pay me for my opinion and I uh, get uh, paid to educate other surgeons on the techniques that we use and travel around the country educating surgeons on hip and knee replacements with advanced technology, including robotics and robotic arm assistance. Long roots in Boulder County. Uh, the tall gentleman there is my grandfather. The short guy hiding behind the cow is myself. Uh, this is a little over 30 years ago uh, when I won a blue ribbon in the Boulder County Fair uh, for showing that cow. Um, my grandparents lived in Longmont for about 50 years. My grandfather was a dentist in town. Um, they passed uh, about a decade ago, um, but I did manage to get some level of uh, in, you know, infamy uh, by getting on the front page of the daily camera uh, with a hayride picture uh, from helping out around the farm. So um, been coming down uh, to Boulder since the late 70s, um, visiting my grandparents and spending a lot of time down here. Uh, so definitely is a place that feels like home. We have uh, expanded this at our own family. Uh, these are my five children uh, that keep us very busy and uh, bring some joy to our lives, um, help keep my wife and I on our toes. Um, this is a picture of us out on the lake, uh, enjoying our sunshine and summertime. Uh, it's one of our preferred activities. So, A little bit more about the specifics of the practice and, and why you tuned in today. Um, my practice focuses on minimally invasive surgical techniques uh, and attempting to combine that with advanced technology. We are able to do the vast majority of cases under a spinal anesthetic, so that means you don't have to have a tube down your throat, you don't have to have general anesthetic, you also do not have to be awake for the surgery, so you are sedated through that process. Uh, length of stay uh, for our knees and hips is dropping, so it's still an average of about one night in the hospital, but more and more patients are being able to be discharged home. So right now it's about 50% of patients that go home the same day and 50% of patients that stay overnight and go home the next day. Uh, 90 plus percent of patients are able to be discharged directly to home with outpatient physical therapy. So we no longer have to have therapists come to your house. We don't have to go to rehabilitation centers. We don't have to go to skilled nursing facilities. Uh, you can recover in the comfort of your own home. And for the last uh, two, three years, we've been doing these at our outpatient surgery center, at the Boulder Surgery Center, uh, with good success and, and happy patients. So um, getting people back to activity um, rapidly um, in a safe manner. We do, at our practice at the Boulder Center for Orthopedics, have the lowest complication rate for hip and knee replacements in Boulder County. Um, it is an excellent facility with uh, fellowship trained uh, orthopedic surgeons uh, looking to provide you with great care and personalized care uh, to get you back to the activities that you enjoy. 
backtrack a little bit about what actually is the most common cause for hip and knee pain that we would need innovative treatments for. The main cause is arthritis, but what, what necessarily is arthritis? What is that uh, encompass? What happens with arthritis is you see on the left-hand side of the screen a nice white uh, sheen at the end of the bone there. Uh, that's the cartilage. It's very smooth. It has a very low friction, uh, and there's no pain fibers in that cartilage. It's ideal for a joint that glides and moves uh, next to an, another uh, bone. Uh, when that cartilage is degraded or starts to wear away, it exposes the bone underneath, and there's a lot of pain fibers in that bone, so that causes a lot of pain and discomfort, um, sometimes toothache-like pain, sometimes sharp and, and acute pain, um, and it generally progresses and gets worse and worse over time. Two main types is this osteoarthritis, which is where that cartilage wears out and exposes the bone underneath. This can be genetic, this can be post-traumatic, um, this can be after a, a surgery for a repair from a previous injury. Um, there's a lot of different ways that this cartilage can wear out, it can be overuse, it can be overweight, it can be just bad luck. Um, and then there's rheumatoid or inflammatory arthritis. This is more of a systemic process that affects the whole body. And examples of this are rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and the rare things like ankylosing spondylitis. This is when the body turns against itself and starts to actually attack the normal tissues, causing pain and discomfort in the joints. So what arthritis looks like on the x-ray and the screen, the left-hand side, you can see there's no space between the bones. We'd like to get x-rays of you standing upright and in different positions so that we can add gravity to the picture. The knee on the right-hand side of the screen has good space between the bones. That's actually the cartilage that we can't actually see on the x-ray. But as you can see on the left-hand knee, uh, that cartilage is gone, and so it allows those bones to rub together. And that's where we get that term bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. It doesn't necessarily have to be as severe as that picture. It can be less severe and isolated to certain parts of the knee, uh, sort of like a cavity in your mouth. It doesn't have to affect the whole tooth. It can just affect one area of the tooth. Same with the knee. It doesn't have to affect the whole knee. It can just affect certain areas of the knee. Hip is similar, so you have a very smooth ball that's inside of this cup moving around. Uh, when that ball starts to be degraded and the hip becomes degraded, the hip stiffens, and often people will have stiffness before they have pain. Uh, they'll have difficulty putting on shoes and socks or trimming their toenails, uh, and then the pain will start. Hips do tend to wear out a lot faster than knees um, and can have pain that comes on more quickly. Again, this is what that looks like on x-ray. Uh, good space between the ball and the cup on the right-hand side of the screen. On the left-hand side of the screen, you can see there's no space between the ball and the cup and big bone spurs even uh, inside that, that, that joint. There are other causes that can cause hip pain. The hip is a very nebulous area. It's actually in the groin where you have the ball and cup, but some people will complain about pain on the side of their hip. Or it hurts worse if you lay on that side, sit in a car for a long period of time, go up and down stairs. There can be back pain that could radiate down to the hip and cause symptoms that are similar to, the, to hip pain symptoms. And then hernias can also cause pain in that groin area. So we try to do a good physical exam. We try to discuss where it hurts when you come into the office. And then we get imaging to help us to differentiate between where we think the pain is coming from and what the cause is and confirm that diagnosis. The number of people needing hip and knee replacements is projected to, to increase dramatically uh, over the next 10 years. So, uh, this study was put out in 2005, uh, and the projection was to go from a half a million uh, joints replaced for hip knees to 3.5 uh, million uh, pretty re replaced annually. Uh, hips was a little lower than that, from 200,000 to 500,000. I mean, we're seeing this in practice. Where there's a lot of people who are wearing out their joints and needing to have their, their joints replaced. So this is a very common cause of hip and knee pain. Patients are getting younger, uh, they're also older. We don't have age limits as far as who's a candidate for joint replacement. There are very healthy people in their 90s that do very well with joint replacement, and there are people who've had bad luck uh, in younger years and have knees or hips that are much older than they are, um, and so these need to be addressed and they need to be taken care of. Um, they have different expectations, so the older patient may just want to go down to the mailbox, whereas the younger patient wants to get back to hiking and enjoying the activities that we have here on the front range. 
Um, patients are also better informed today. Uh, they can get access to, to talks like this. They can get access from information on the internet. Um, but beware what's on the internet. There is no quality control on the internet. Um, and people can put up there whatever information they want. Um, and that's especially true of stem cells and regenerative medicine claims uh, for treatment of hip and knee pain. But we all want to help you avoid having to have a joint replacement. Uh, that's actually my first goal is to see if there's something we can do short of having a joint replacement surgery. There are many different ways we can help treat hip and knee pain without surgery. Um, and I want to kind of review some of those as we get started in the talk today. Initially, just rest, um, some ice or heat applications, uh, over-the-counter anti-inflammatory medications like ibuprofen, Aleve, Tylenol uh, can be very helpful. Um, there's a surprising number of people that come in my office who say they don't want to take any pills, uh, even though it does help. Um, and obviously, you don't want to take a high dose of those pills for a long period of time. But at low doses used uh, judiciously, uh, they can be very effective in helping with pain relief from hip and knee arthritis. Lifestyle modification can be important. So if you are a big runner, if you switch to bicycling, if you move to an elliptical, lower impact activities, we want you to be active. We want you to, to be out and moving those joints. That actually helps them feel better. Uh, but you want to do it in a joint healthy and joint smart manner. Physical therapy can be helpful for maintaining the strength and mobility around the joint. Um, there are also joint fluid supplements and different injections. And there's enough of those. That I think we should talk about those more in depth. Uh, right after the surgery. We talk about knee arthroscopy. Uh, that is when they used to go in and try to clean up the knee or try to buy you a little time. That has definitely fallen out of favor. Uh, they have found that there are lots of people who have degenerative tears of meniscuses or arthritis in the knee, and actually going in with a knee scope isn't very helpful to take and clean those up or try to buy you some time. So um, we're actually moving away from those sorts of arthroscopic treatments for knee arthritis. Um, but if you do have an acute injury, uh, an acute meniscus tear that's causing some mechanical symptoms where it's catching in the joint or there's loose bodies in the joint, those can be addressed arthroscopically. Uh, but generalized arthritis is definitely not treated uh, with a arthroscopic procedure any further. And then we'll talk about joint replacement. This is the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons uh, guidelines for non-surgical management of osteoarthritis. Um, lots of specifics in here, but sort of the big take-home points are weight loss is important. Um, we want to try to get a BMI lower uh, than 25 if we can. Um, that will help take weight off of the joints. Exercise therapy is helpful. Um, again, the anti-inflammatories um, like we discussed earlier, and then these intra-articular injections. So uh, good recommendations for these, um, and I think it's a good first step. So um, once you find out there's a problem, there are a lot of things you can do on your own to try to make it feel better. Uh, and then if those things don't work, then that's when you want to come in and see your doctor. So uh, if these at-home remedies, the, the rice, the rest, ice, compression, elevation, uh, combined with over-the-counter medications isn't helping, um, there are now topical compounds that are over-the-counter. Uh, Voltaren gel is now over-the-counter. Um, and then there are also oral supplements like glucosamine and chondroitin. There aren't any big studies uh, that support the use of glucosamine and chondroitin, but I know there are a lot of patients who swear by it on an individual basis. So if it works for you, great. Uh, but if you're not sure, maybe stop it for a while and see if you notice any difference. The body mass index or the, the weight is very important because you actually carry five to seven times your body weight across your joint going up and down stairs. Um, and we want to limit that if we can. So it's a good bang for the buck to lose weight and get that weight down to take that weight off your joints. I've actually had a few patients who were certain they needed to have their joints replaced, but they were able to lose weight uh, through a combination of, of discussion with their doctors and exercise and diet, um, and their knee pain got significantly better uh, once the weight was off. And then avoiding those high impact activities like running and jumping, those are very hard on the joints. Uh, so we want you to do more joint healthy activities, swimming, biking, uh, that type of thing. Going up and down stairs and squats is very hard on the knees. Um, although there are good exercises to build the strength in the legs, um, there is a payoff for that with the pain that can come in the knees. Joint injections is sort of the next level. So if these over-the-counter medications and these uh, non-invasive treatments uh, haven't given you benefit, uh, then injections is sort of the next step. Usually we start with the most common ones, which are cortisone injections. Um, they are a combination of numbing medicine and some anti-inflammatory cortisone uh, that we inject into the joint. This decreases the pain and inflammation in the joint for a short period of time. 
Uh, that can be three or four months. Um, there are some studies showing that uh, giving people too many of these injections uh, too often uh, can cause degradation of the cartilage uh, in the joint. So you want to use these judiciously and try to spread them out. Uh, we try to spread them out by at least four months um, in our facility. Visco supplementation uh, or the chicken shots is sort of the next step up from there. These are covered by most insurances in these, but not in hips. Um, in that AOS slide that I showed a couple minutes ago, uh, it does state that there's not great evidence for these hyaluronic acid injections, uh, but they are something that we can use. In my practice, we try to give this hyaluronic acid in patients whose x-rays don't show enough arthritis that they need to have a knee replacement, and it seems to work better in less severe arthritis, or in patients who really don't want to have surgery and make sure that they've tried every option that they can. There are some people who the hyaluronic acid injections work very well for, uh, so I don't want to write them off completely, uh, but we have found that they work about 50 or 60% of the time, but if they do, they work you know, for four to six months, and you can repeat those every six months as long as they're effective for you. PRP or platelet-rich plasma, these are injections of these concentrated blood products that are uh, attempting to enhance healing. So they actually draw blood from you, spin it down, and then inject the, the concentrated plasma into the uh, joint. This has some very good efficacy in soft tissue, uh, in tennis elbow, in hamstring tears, uh, and some soft tissue issues. Um, it has less uh, evidence for success in joints. Uh, but it is still under investigation and people are studying if there's good benefit for this or not. Uh, it's not covered by the insurance and can be expensive in the five to $600 range. Um, so kind of have risk, discuss the risks and benefits uh, with your own doctor and see if this is a, an option for you. And then stem cells is a very common uh, discussion that we have at the office. Uh, there's a lot of potential and promise in stem cells. The idea here is that we, the companies that do this obtain the stem cells, uh, concentrate them down, uh, and then inject them into the joint to decrease inflammation and promote healing. Uh, again, it's not covered by insurance and is very expensive in the five, ten, dollars or even $20,000 range. Um, and there's not a whole lot of evidence and data that's out there. Um, they actually think that they're going to put me out of business and, and shuffle me off hip and knee replacements to the dustbin of history um, as some sort of archaic a uh, horrible procedure um, that was harming patients. Um, so I decided to look further into this and see what the data and evidence was in support of stem cells uh, versus actual surgeries for hip and knee arthritis. Uh, this is from the Regenex website um, a few years ago, uh, looking at their efficacy. So they, the stem cells are called bone marrow aspirate concentrate, so that's that BMAC on the slide. And they're comparing a knee society score, which is out of 100. So 100 is perfect. Anything lower than that is significant uh, morbidity. Uh, and they compared total knee arthroplasty, or TKA, to this bone marrow aspirate concentrate. Uh, preoperatively, the patients uh, had significantly worse knee society scores in the um, total knee replacement group. <coughs> Excuse me. And then uh, after surgery or after injection, both groups got better. Um, with the total knee replacement group getting significantly uh, better compared to pre-op uh, than the stem cell group. So um, I would say that this actually supports knee replacement over stem cells uh, as there was some far superior uh, improvement in scores uh, from a knee replacement as compared to the stem cells. In hips, uh, it's even more dramatic. So uh, this Harris hip score is again out of 100 with 100 being a perfect score um, and very good. And then everything lower than that um, obviously being poor and, and detrimental to people's mobility. Uh, the total hip arthroplasty, the THA group, um, went from an average of 56 to 94, so a marked improvement, whereas the stem cell or bone marrow aspirate group uh, went from about 69 to 83. So there was some improvement, uh, but there was marked improvement and marked uh, excellence, I would say, in the total hip replacement as compared to a stem cell injection. So. Um, I think that there may be some promise in the treatment of stem cells. There are definitely medically viable reasons to use stem cells uh, for certain diagnoses. I currently do not think those diagnoses include hip and knee arthritis. Um, it's a little bit like the snake oil salesman. Um, snake oil used to work, um, actually, uh, and it worked not because of the snakes, but because of the capsaicin powder that was in the snake oil. Uh, and so just because there are some people that get a little better from stem cells uh, does not necessarily mean that all stem cells are going to be helpful. So 
I think this requires some more research um, and investigation, but I cannot recommend stem cells at this time. So I actually think that they will probably be shuffled to the dustbin of history uh, along with the makers of snake oil. But I will admit surgery is a difficult decision. It could be daunting to think about going in and, and having your joint replaced. Uh, there was actually a study in Duke uh, a few years ago talking about uh, they offered joint replacement to patients and 88% of them declined to have joint replacement uh, at that time. Uh, unfortunately, osteoarthritis is a degenerative disease. Uh, it's only gonna get worse over time. There may be good days, there may be worse days, but in general, the, the de general trend is gonna be down. And there are better outcomes that have been reported in patients that have surgery sooner rather than those that wait up to two years. So uh, patients who had their surgery uh, sooner had improved function and uh, reduced pain after the joint replacement. And so I think this is a sign of people who don't get as bad as they could. It used to be that you were told, told all the patients, you know, wait as long as you can, wait until you absolutely have to. Um, and now we tell people to have the surgery at the appropriate time after they've sort of exhausted the non-operative measures rather than wait until they absolutely can't stand it any longer. And I think that the patients are doing better because of that change. There's improvements in the materials for both hip and knee replacement. Uh, there's better wear rates. Uh, used to be people would say that hip and knee replacements lasted approximately 10 years. Uh, now we think there's a 90% chance they last 20 years. We think there's a good chance they last 30. Uh, so there's definitely been improvements in the materials that we're using. Uh, we're moving more toward partial versus total knee replacements. Uh, so we can address more specifically the areas of pain um, and give people a more normal feeling knee. There's minimally invasive surgical procedures and techniques that allow for quicker recovery and less pain after the surgery, uh, and new designs uh, for uh, executing these surgeries with uh, our advanced technology. The biggest one for this is Mako Robotics. So uh, this is robotic arm-assisted surgery. Um, we brought this with us uh, as I came to Boulder uh, 10 years ago. Um, and I think it's been a game changer for Boulder County and uh, the surrounding area as far as being able to deliver excellent results to all of our patients. So it's computer navigated, robotic arm assisted, but as you can see, the surgeon is right there holding the arm, holding the instrument. It is not automated. We unfortunately are not just sitting in the hallway having a cup of coffee while the robot does the surgery. Uh, we are right there um, involved, hands-on. Um, it just allows us to be more precise and accurate uh, in performing the surgery. The idea initially started with the robotic arm assisted surgery for partial knee replacements. And so we'll start talking about there. Um, when there is cartilage damage and pain that's isolated to just one compartment of the knee, um, that can be addressed individually. It's usually medial lateral, but sometimes can be under the kneecap. And so the idea is if there's wear and tear on that uh, joint, that we just address the area where that wear and tear occurs. So um, we can go in and just replace the inside or outside of the knee we can replace under the kneecap. Um, so this is in patients who just have pain going up and down stairs, squatting, but on flat ground they can walk extreme distances, um, which is relatively common here in Boulder. Or in rare instances, there are patients who are of uh, young enough age where we wanna try to maintain bone and conserve bone, and they have an intact uh, ACL and PCL, and we can actually replace two thirds of the knee. So we can sort of do a hybrid of a partial knee uh, where we have control over these components and, and give them a specialized knee just for them. The idea and how this works and how this sort of makoplasty, mako procedure functions is as long as the patients have the correct indication for the procedure, um, <coughs> excuse me, we perform a CT scan from the hip through the knee down to the ankle and we actually make a 3D model of that actual patient's knee that we have on the computer so that we can review that and plan off the actual individual patient. We can use this model to place our implants and we can plan to a tenth of a degree or a tenth of a millimeter and place those components exactly where they need to fit on each individual patient in order to optimize their uh, function and outcome. Once we have our plan set, um, we bring the patient back, uh, we put some pins in the thigh bone and uh, shin bone so that we can track the bones in space as we're moving through. Um, we then find the center of the hip so that we can try to line up the center of the hip through the center of the knee down to the center of the ankle. We map out the knee in space with these optical trackers, kind of like GPS. Uh, we combine 
the patient's real knee with the CT and the 3D model of the knee, and then we're actually able to confirm this. So this helps to make sure that we're getting accurate information uh, and that is actually the same patient and the, that we have the CT scan on that we have on the table. Once we've sort of matched and mirrored those up, we can then take the knee through a range of motion and watch the results of that on the screen. And we can tension the ligaments and really optimize where that knee replacement should go before we've committed any cuts. So we can optimize implant tracking. Uh, we can optimize cartilage mapping and make sure there's a new, nice, smooth transition from regular remaining cartilage that's healthy down to the new implant. And we can balance the joint before we have any bone cuts. So we can figure out exactly where those parts need to fit for that individual patient. Um, I call it an infinitely personalized process because we can take off-the-shelf components and put it exactly where it needs to fit for you and move it in any position that we want uh, because of this computer navigation and, and 3D tracking uh, and then actually execute that surgery with the aid of the robotic arm, which is pretty exciting. It's done through a minimal incision for less tissue damage, uh, so it allows us to get patients up and moving and back to activity faster. When we actually have the, the patients there uh, on the floor, on the bed, and we have our plan finalized, uh, we bring in an operative burr, and this high-speed burr allows us to remove the bone uh, for, so we can replace it with the implant. Um, it creates a room with a floor and a ceiling and walls so that we can't go outside of the area that we intend to cut. Um, it allows us to prevent cutting anything we don't want to cut either of any soft tissue um, or ligaments. So it allows us to be safer and more accurate and more precise in placement of our implants. This is what that looks like when we have that bone prepared and then we cement in the, the component. And this is what it looks like on x-ray where we have the arthritis here on the left on the inside part of the knee and then we replace that knee on the inside uh, and you can see that space has returned and the knee is in a better alignment um, and the remainder of the knee is in good shape and will do very well. In general, this is a less invasive, uh, very accurate, and most importantly, reproducible uh, surgery. It's bone conserving. It leaves the knee in a more normal state, so it leaves your ACL and PCL intact, so it feels more normal um, and allows for a little quicker recovery. Studies have shown uh, that there's actually less pain uh, with a robotic arm-assisted partial knee as compared to a manually done uh, partial knee replacement. Uh, there's actually lower pain scores at six days for the robotic arm assisted surgery uh, as opposed to six weeks for the uh, manual surgery. So uh, significant improvements in uh, outcomes uh, by using this robotic technology. It also has given higher patient satisfaction scores that carry over from uh, two to five years. So uh, 90 plus percent of patients are satisfied or very satisfied with their knee replacement at two years and five years uh, with almost nobody dissatisfied or very dissatisfied. Like anything in life, there is nothing that is perfect and there are some patients that, that have uh, poor outcomes but they are uh, in a very low number. There's also less of a risk of an early revision rate. Partial knee replacements have a bit of a bad rap because they can wear out relatively quickly if they're not put in very well. Uh, so you can see at this two-year follow-up, looking at different registries from both the Swedish and Australian registry for joint replacement, it's almost a 5% uh, two-year revision rate for partial knee, uh, as opposed to 1.2% with my mentor, uh, Tom Kuhn, uh, in a multi-center study looking at robotic partial knee replacements. This is actually now carried out uh, to 10 years, and it's still only uh, less than 2% revision rate at 10 years, so uh, patients are doing very well with these robotic uh, partial knee replacements. Unfortunately, not every candidate uh, for a partial knee or a, every person who has knee pain and arthritis is a candidate for a partial knee, and the majority of patients do need to have a total knee, uh, but now we're able to combine this uh, advanced robotic technology for total knee replacements as well. The basics of what a knee replacement is for a total knee, uh, we replace the end of the thigh bone or the femur uh, with a metal, uh, most often cobalt chrome, uh, and then a surface of the tibia is also replaced uh, with a metal, often titanium, uh, and then a plastic liner is placed in between to act as the bearing surface or new cartilage. Um, we then put a little button on the back side of the kneecap uh, with plastic. So um, you get a, a new metal and plastic knee. So that takes this knee that's very normal and healthy. Uh, unfortunately, they develop arthritis and exposed bone underneath as that cartilage wears out. 
Um, exposing that bone uh, and pain fibers underneath that cartilage. And then this is what that looks like when we go in and resurface the ends of the bones, uh, put this metal and plastic in place, and get rid of that bone on bone arthritis. So, that's what it looks like on x-ray. So again, a normal knee x-ray here on the left, an arthritic x-ray on the right uh, with bone on bone arthritis and, and wear and tear. Um, failed non-operative measures with medicines and injections. Uh, and this is their new knee replacement. So um, you can see we replaced that bone on bone uh, with metal and plastic uh, to give them a new bearing surface uh, and reduce their pain and discomfort. Why in the world do we need to use a robot to do this? There is a lot of variability in manual instrumentation. So these are what those tools look like that we use for a traditional knee replacement. Um, and there's a lot of sort of eyeballing that goes in there. There's a lot of sort of guesswork. Um, these tools can be useful, um, and they, a total knee replacement is a very uh, good procedure. Um, but as you look at large studies, there's 80 to 85% of patients that are satisfied with their knee replacement, uh, but that leaves 15 to 20% of patients who are unsatisfied. And so that's where we're trying to make improvements uh, in how we do the surgery, how we assess the joint intraoperatively, um, and then how we actually make changes intraoperatively to the plan uh, to try to give higher patient satisfaction scores as well as making the implants last longer. So this is sort of that disconnect that we're looking at is there's 80% of people that are satisfied, 99% survivorship, but there's this 18% gap. We wanna have every patient be uh, satisfied with their joint replacement um, as well as have that joint replacement last a long period of time. So that's where we're trying to make these improvements with this robotic arm uh, technology. And this is what the MAKO Total Knee workflow looks like. Uh, so we start with uh, preoperative planning. Again, we get that same CT scan from the hip to the knee to the ankle, uh, make these 3D models, and then we can plan directly off of the patient's own body using off-the-shelf uh, components to find out exactly where they need to fit on each patient uh, for optimal uh, joint replacement. We then place those pins in the thigh bone and shin bone so we can track those bones in space, register the bone so that we can confirm that it's this patient's CT scan, this patient's bone, and so that we know where that is relative to those arrays that we placed in the thigh bone and shin bone. And then this is really the most important part and what differentiates this robotic arm technology from others is this intraoperative balancing and assessment. So we can actually get information real time during the surgery based on your own soft tissue and your own CT scan, your own bone, uh, and see how that our surgery is gonna go if we commit to these position of the implants. So we get to see the results of the surgery before we make any bone cuts or commit to the position of the, the implants. So then we can then optimize the end result of the surgery by making those intraoperative adjustments and then executing that plan with the robotic arm in a safe manner so that it's controlled and only cuts the area of bone that needs to be cut. This is what that looks like zoomed in. So um, we start by making sure that we have the correct size uh, for the, each individual patient for both their femoral and tibial components. Uh, we make sure that they're lined up to the uh, mechanical axis that we want uh, for the patients and then uh, scroll through and make sure that we have these sizes available. Um, this is sort of our entry point and kind of our plan that we use for each individual patient uh, as our starting point to get their interoperative information and make some adjustments. This is going through and sort of we place these arrays. We're actually registering the patient's actual bone and combining that with their real CT scan so we can track the leg in space. Um, it goes through a process where we give the, the robot information and then we confirm it from the CT scan. So um, there's really no way to have what's called garbage in or garbage out, which was a, a big problem with older style computer navigation. Uh, this image guided system um, allows for better accuracy and, uh, and execution of the plan. And then this is our dynamic pre-resection balancing. So this is where we can actually take the knee through a range of motion in different positions and see what kind of gap we're gonna have and how those implants are gonna interact with each other. So we can see to make sure they're lined up in the appropriate manner. We can make sure that we can use these gaps as a surrogate for joint balance. Um, and we can make sure that they're equal on both sides. So we wanna have a nice, well-balanced knee throughout the range of motion um, so the patients can maintain full range of motion uh, as well as feel like the knee is stable through, through that arc of motion. So um, that allows us to, to really fine tune and dial in our surgical procedure for this knee replacement. 
So we can look at that in extension, which was the previous slide, and inflection. Um, once we have these gaps balanced, um, this is a single radius design for the, the knee replacement, so it will actually track um, and be stable throughout the arc of motion. Um, and once we're happy with where those positions are, uh, and then we make our appropriate changes, you know, then we bring in that robotic arm that we guide, we're still in control of the saw, we still turn it off, we still turn it on, um, we get to guide it. But the robotic arm keeps us in line with the cuts that we want to make and keeps us from cutting outside of the lines. So um, it's a little bit like a, a school teacher telling you to color inside the lines, uh, but being very firm and making sure that you don't cut outside the lines. We make our five cuts around the distal femur, uh, removing this excess bone. That's then going to be replaced by that metal uh, femoral component. And then cut off the, the proximal portion of the tibia as well. So this is all done uh, in a manner that's very safe. Um, it allows us to protect the patellar tendon, to protect the ligaments, uh, and protect our posterior cruciate ligament. Um, the ACL is removed in almost all knee replacement surgeries, uh, and that function is replaced with the design of the implant. Early studies looking at robotic arm-assisted knee replacement versus manual and traditional knee replacement uh, shows that there's um, a less blood loss, uh, there's lower pain scores in the robotic group as compared to the manual group, uh, and this holds true throughout the recovery period. Uh, they have a quicker return to home, they have a less physical therapy that they need, they have fewer uh, morphine equivalents or less narcotics that they take after the surgery. Uh, so it doesn't make the procedure painless or pain-free, it just makes it less painful uh, than more traditional procedures. So I think this is because we're able to better tension the joint and we don't have areas that are under tension or where we're trying to force the knee into a position um, to recover and because we're not inadvertently cutting soft tissue that doesn't need to be cut, uh, which can happen with uh, manual uh, techniques. So we want to combine this technology with minimally invasive surgical techniques and minimally invasive total knee replacement. Uh, my mentor, Tom Kuhn, uh, was one of the inventors of minimally invasive surgery uh, approximately 20 years ago. Um, really worked to advance the techniques and technology. At that point in time, it was not uncommon for people to stay a week or two in the hospital after a knee replacement. Uh, they made big, huge incisions and really tried to work under the guise of needing to have that sort of exposure to know what they were doing. Um, and so he really worked to uh, provide a low trauma surgery, um, get patients up and moving, uh, and have patients go home sooner. So patients now go home the same day, they go home the next day. Uh, so we want patients to be able to get up and have a rapid rehabilitation um, and get on with their lives after the surgery. That doesn't mean it's, again, zero pain, um, it's just much improved from where we were at 20 years ago. So our goal is to prevent the bad effects of anesthesia and the bad effects from the surgery. So we try to use some preemptive analgesia. And this is why we want the spinal anesthetic. It's a short acting spinal that wears off relatively quickly. Um, some anti-inflammatory medicine that we give you before the surgery to help uh, prevent that. We actually even give that to you the night before surgery uh, to help reduce that inflammation after the surgery and then help prevent the side effects from uh, anesthesia uh, by anti-nausea medications and trying to protect your stomach. Uh, we do that spinal anesthetic, we sedate you so you don't have to be awake for the surgery, and we even do injections of numbing medication around the joint at the time of surgery. So all this is an attempt to make you have less pain uh, when you wake up after the surgery. When we're completed the surgery, uh, we want you to get up, we want you to move around, we want you to get up and walk in that same day. Um, get up, work with the physical therapist. Um, so we've had, it takes an entire team approach. So this starts with the pre-surgical testing team at the hospital, uh, the anesthesia team, uh, the pre-op nurses, the intraoperative nurses, the post-op nurses in the PACU. Um, everybody's working together to make sure that you have a good experience. And then we bring in the therapist to get you up and moving and, and try to get you home safely the same day. So um, get people up, get people moving uh, with therapy. Um, and like I said, about half people are, people are able to go home the same day, um, and the other half, for whatever reason, need to stay a night in the hospital. Uh, we did eight surgeries today, and five of those people went home the same day. Um, and you know, some other people were needed some more time in the hospital, which is fully appropriate. We're not going to send you home before you need to, but we're also not going to keep you longer than you need to be either. So how does this affect hips and hip arthritis? So. Um, if you've been focusing on uh, hip pain and had to sit through the knee pain talk, I appreciate your patience. Um, this, this next section is for you. So um, 
there's been big improvements in hip replacements uh, through the years. Um, there's definitely optimizing the design and, and wear rates um, and finding now they have services that can wear for more than 30 years um, using very safe materials. Uh, there was a push 15 or 20 years ago to do bearing services that were metal on metal and this caused uh, some pain, some problems and issues um, because those metal parts would release metal ions which could inflame the joint and get into the bloodstream. Um, I currently try to avoid any sort of metal on metal articulation so we do metal cup with a plastic liner, metal stem with a ceramic ball, so you have a ceramic on plastic construct that has a very low wear rate and actually does reduce your risk for infection as well. Uh, this was a year ago, there was actually an episode of Grey's Anatomy where one of the uh, senior attendings was going through some mental issues and it was because of his metal on metal hip replacement. So uh, even this has made it into mainstream pseudo-medicine TV shows. So we want to, how do we want to do a hip replacement? How do we want to get people back to, to activity in a safe manner? So this is where the direct anterior approach comes in. Um, this is uh, by far the most common surgical approach for hip replacement in Boulder itself uh, and is rapidly expanding um, around the country. Uh, it is not brand new. It has been out for uh, 30 plus years um, and is actually longer than that, but has been popularized in the United States um, in the last 30 years. So it's a, a minimally invasive uh, approach to the hip that allows us to spread between muscles so we don't have to detach any muscles, we don't have to cut through any muscles, we don't have to release any tendons uh, when no ligaments are, are damaged. Um, and so it gives us excellent access to the hip uh, in order to replace that uh, with minimal damage to the soft tissue. And that allows for quicker recoveries. Traditional hip replacement can have a six to 12 inch incision on the side uh, or back side of the joint. In order to do that, you have to cut through big muscles uh, to get access to the joint. Um, and this can lead to some instability or pain after the surgery. Uh, with the direct anterior approach, it's a four to six inch incision, um, and we spread between the muscles. It's an approach from the front of the hip, so we're actually able to spread between those muscles in the front of the hip. Um, and the hip joint is actually closer to the front. And we don't re remove any muscle, we don't cut through any muscles or there are no muscles or tendons that are detached. Why I do it this way? Um, so I learned how to do this in my fellowship training. Um, when I was in residency, we did not do any direct anterior approach. Um, and the reason I've switched fully to direct anterior um, is for the following. Uh, the hip is, like I said, closer to the front of the body. Um, but the biggest thing is we're able to spread between muscles to get there. We can use a true surgical anatomy and go on an intermuscular plane, an internervous plane. We're not detaching any muscles. We're not cutting any muscles. It's minimal risk to nerves and vessels. Uh, so I think it's a truly minimally invasive surgery uh, that allows patients a, a more rapid recovery um, and less complications down the road as far as the stability of the hip joint. Uh, less pain, uh, quicker restoration of function, and a shorter hospital stay, so either same day or overnight. All of that combines for this probably being a more economical approach, um, so there's less PT afterwards. Actually, the majority of patients don't need any formal physical therapy after the surgery, um, although everybody does see physical therapy in the hospital to learn how to use their walker and to do the exercises and to safely uh, learn how to do stairs. Uh, but in general, I think the economics of this show that it's a less expensive approach than a posterior approach. It's an ideal soft tissue interval. Um, we can actually lay the patient on their back, which is easier for anesthesia uh, to monitor them. Uh, we do attach you to this crazy table, um, but we use that to position your leg in space uh, so we can get access to the joint. It's a very simple to instrument the socket portion of the hip replacement. Uh, and then we use that table to maneuver the, the leg in space so that we can access the femoral component. Why doesn't everybody do this if it's so great? It can be unfamiliar territory. Uh, we are all trained in residency to be very familiar with the posterior approach. Um, and so it's a little bit confusing to look at things from a different angle. Uh, if you're used to looking at it from a posterior approach with the patient up on their side, as opposed to an anterior approach with the patients on their back, uh, you know, it can be a little bit daunting to kind of learn how to reorient yourself uh, and figure out exactly where you're at in the surgery. Um, the exposure of the femur can be difficult. Um, so there are stories of these surgeries taking four to six hours uh, because they're trying to get the exposure down and trying to perform this safely. Um, in general, we can now do this in you know, 30 to 45 minutes, uh, depending on the patient, um, and do this with very excellent exposure of both the, the femur and the, the cup. Um, and it does require a little bit of specialized equipment to get started. 
kind of review how it's done and kind of show you how that process looks. Um, these are the special instruments that we use. Uh, so they're not dramatically different. Um, some longer retractors, uh, some specialized uh, equipment to be able to get access into the hip joint, uh, but nothing that isn't in every OR uh, in the country. We do use special lights on our heads so that we can see into the hole that we're making. And this device that you get uh, positioned into is called an arch table. Um, and it acts as an assistant that moves and holds your leg uh, without getting tired, without asking for a bathroom break, and more importantly, without asking for a raise. This is a video. Up on the right-hand side is the patient's head. On the left is the feet. Um, we're going to make the incision through the skin and identify these muscles um, and show you how we spread between them. These are all the name structures that we know where they are, and so we stay away from them. Uh, we actually enter into the fascia. There's one little vessel that you can see crosses the hip joint, and that's what we actually coagulate and keep control over. Um, but our knowledge of this anatomy allows us to perform this surgery very safely and reproducibly. We're able to put our retractors in and gain access to the hip joint, and then actually open up that hip joint uh, to expose the arthritic joint underneath. So, the capsule is usually very thickened, um, and it can help to reduce the motion and cause some inflammation. Uh, so we often remove some of the capsule through the time of surgery. Once that capsule is removed, um, we expose that uh, bone uh, and the, the ball and cup portion of the socket. We go in and uh, remove the femoral head. So we actually cut that in situ. So we're, we're actually disarticulating the hip joint and removing that femoral head to get rid of the, the pain generating uh, degraded femoral head. And we use special tools to allow us to get those out safely and without damaging any of the soft tissue. Then turn our attention to the cup side uh, or the socket side. We place our retractors in place and you can see we have an excellent view of that cup remove any excess soft tissue, and then we prepare the bone uh, by getting rid of the hard arthritic bone and exposing uh, bleeding bone underneath so we can place a cup. The cup is initially placed with friction, and then the bone grows onto it. And then we place and secure a plastic liner uh, for our bearing surface. Once that's in place, we turn our attention to the femoral side and trying to expose the proximal femur so we can uh, manipulate that joint in the proper area, um, and so we can machine and put in a new new stem and ball. So we're using these retractors to gain access. We're releasing the capsule off the uh, proximal end of the femur. And then we gain access into the actual femoral canal. And we use a series of brooches to find the correct size for the patient. And it does involve sort of hammering things in as you're seeing here. And when we find the correct size, we can then use a trial neck and a trial ball uh, to make sure that we have the correct implants available for that particular patient uh, to make sure they have a stable hip while trying our best to maintain leg lengths um, and match those up to the other side. So once we've rebuilt uh, our new ball and cup, um, we're going to remove our retractors here. And we don't use this uh, hook anymore either. So um, this is a little bit of a, an outdated video. But as they swing around and adjust the camera view, you'll be able to see the muscles uh, on the medial side that we don't cut. So those are all left intact. Those muscles are removed when you do a posterior approach, and that's why there's more stability from an anterior approach as opposed to a posterior approach uh, for a hip replacement. So then we put that ball back into the cup. With traditional hip replacement, there are restrictions as far as flexing your leg up or crossing your leg, having to sleep on your back with a pillow between your leg. Uh, with a direct anterior approach, um, there's very limited restrictions. Really what I don't want you to do is bring your leg all the way out to the side and bring it back behind you. Um, so that's something people rarely do. Uh, and so people are, have fewer restrictions with a direct anterior approach, almost none, as compared to more traditional posterior approach. So the stability is increased with an anterior approach as compared to a posterior approach. So we've already discussed the decreased hospital stay, quicker rehabilitation, less rehabilitation, less physical therapy, smaller incision, reduced muscle damage, um, allow for a little shorter recovery time, less scarring. 
Uh, there's potential for less blood loss, um, less time in surgery, so these are very uh, quickly and efficiently done surgeries. Nobody's trying to rush. This isn't a NASCAR pit stop. Uh, every surgery takes as long as it takes to, to get done uh, as excellently as we can, uh, but it does less, not a whole lot of time. And then there's reduced post-operative pain. The risk of dislocation or that ball popping out of the cup is definitely reduced from an anterior approach. And then because we're not cutting those muscles or soft tissue, um, it may allow for a more natural return to function and activity. I think this minimally invasive surgical approach is better for patients, um, few, uh, if any, hip precautions, and it allows us excellent control over the, the placement of the components uh, for a long-lasting uh, hip replacement. So now we have this excellent soft tissue procedure, and we want to combine that with the technology that we've discussed previously for knees. So how can we use this technology in hip replacement patients? Why would we want to use navigation and technology? It gives us this increased level of precision and increased control over our components, an increased level of planning. So traditional hip replacement planning is done in two dimensions. The hip is a three-dimensional system. Uh, it's a three-dimensional object. So when we use a CT scan to create these models, it gives us better planning and, and execution. Um, taking an x-ray in the recovery room is too late. We can't make any changes at that point. So we want to try to optimize our surgical results before we perform our surgery and while we're actually in the time of surgery uh, for each individual patient to have the best outcome that they can. Again, on the left, you can see this is a plain x-ray, two-dimensional planning and templating as opposed to the right side of the uh, screen, uh, robotic uh, total hip replacement with a 3D CT scan uh, that really allows us to individually plan for the cup, where that should be, how big it should be, uh, and then for the stem side, again, how big that should be, where that should fit. Um, and then we can actually see our results and see what our change in leg length and offset is going to be uh, for each surgery before we perform the surgery or even in the operating room. There was a study that came out left-hand side of the screen from Massachusetts General Hospital, that's what MGH stands for, uh, looking at their own results for placement of that cup. There's a target zone uh, that's a, called a safety zone. Uh, and on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see it's that black box. Uh, of all those dots on that entire side of the screen, 50% of those or less were inside that box. So the accuracy at Massachusetts General Hospital, which is considered to be a very excellent center of hip replacement health, um, shows that they were not very accurate in the placement of their components uh, or on the cup side. Whereas compared to robotic uh, arm-assisted total hip replacements, 96% of those were in the target zone, uh, with 95% being within four degrees of the plan. Uh, so it allows us increased accuracy, uh, increased execution, um, and better reproducibility for patients. So hips are very tolerant. Um, they can get away with poor position, but that doesn't mean that they have to. So this a uh, couple more studies, patients, people trying to prove that they don't need a robot is what Dr. Dome was doing in Hinsdale, uh, Illinois. He's the mentor for one of my partners, Dr. Austin Chen, who performs a number of hip replacements himself using a robotic arm, and this is why. So comparing himself at manual instrumentation versus the robot, the robot was 100% compared to 80% for the safe zone uh, when he tried to do this with manual instrumentation. Uh, so he was better with the robot than he was without. And so I think while 80% isn't bad, it's better than the Massachusetts General uh, study that we just looked at, uh, but the robotic arm assisted surgery was more accurate. So this is what we're trying to do is get our cups in a consistent reproducible position. The goals of the surgery are still the same. Uh, we want to have pain relief. That's our number one goal. So we want to get rid of the pain in the hip joint. We want to return you to your function and lifestyle, whatever that is, whether that's hiking, biking, skiing, swimming, elliptical. Uh, we frown on running and jumping long term, um, but you know, we want you to be active. Uh, and then we want you to have a stable hip. So uh, we want the pain to be gone. We want the hip to be stable. Um, we want to optimize all these patient outcomes to the best degree that we can and do it in an economic fashion. So while the robot is expensive, there is not a per case uh, increase in the cost of the robot at this time. Um, and it, it, you know, it just allows us to perform the surgery uh, in a more accurate manner. It does involve getting a CT scan, uh, which is slightly more expensive, but the reduction of risk for further complications uh, is the benefit from that slight cost. So again, direct into your approach, sort of taking these minimally invasive knee uh, pearls that we had, uh, providing early analgesia, uh, a low trauma surgery, and getting you up, getting you moving, uh, getting you home. 
similar cocktail that we use for hips and knees, the anti-inflammatory the night before and the morning of surgery, the spinal anesthetic, trying to prevent the side effects and nausea from the, the anesthesia. Again, with an injection that we use around the capsule, um, you are able to sleep through this. It's actually encouraged for you not to be awake for the surgery, although you can have as light a sedation as you want. There have been people who've been fully awake for their surgery, um, but it does sound a little strange in there with the knives and saws and hammers that we use uh, to perform the, the operation. Again, get people up, get people moving, uh, ambulation on the same day, uh, and then get you, get you home as soon as we can, whether that's same day or, or next day. This uh, is the first gentleman that I did a hip replacement on in Boulder County uh, nearly 10 years ago. Uh, he is 80 uh, years old. He actually broke his hip skiing, um, and so we went into hip replacement instead of trying to fix the, the broken bone. Um, and seven months after, or sorry, three months after surgery, uh, he was cresting the Teton Pass, and four months after surgery, he did a century ride. So um, this is definitely a, a very bolder patient, um, but an excellent outcome. And at an update at 18 months after his hip replacement, he had put 10,000 miles on his bike. So very active gentleman, uh, but this is what we want people to get back to uh, if they're able. So in summary, our robotic uh, total hips are more accurate than our manual total hips. This has been shown in multiple different studies. Uh, and then that leads to a lower dislocation rate, uh, less difference in leg lengths, uh, uh, less blood loss, and then better patient reported outcome scores in robotics hips versus manual hips. Uh, so I think this is a, a definite addition to our low trauma surgery uh, to give excellent results by adding this technology. Um, when they look at the robotic assisted total hips, there was a slightly longer OR time for the, compared to the manual total hips, but there was no increase in infection. And then, you know, the robot does cost money, um, but where that cost is borne um, sort of leaves further analysis to how effective this is. In general, I kind of want to finish with this sort of end of the commercial stuff. Um, in general, talking about surgery, we've talked a lot about surgery. There are risks with surgery. Uh, they are, you know, not limited, but include, you know, bleeding, infection, damage to nerves and vessels, need for further surgery, risk of blood clots, blood clots go into your lungs, and then rare things like stroke, heart attack, and death. With hips, there's also a risk of dislocation, change in the leg length, or anytime we sur do surgery on bone, there's risk of breaking the bone. Um, so these are all things that are very rare. Um, in fact, Boulder Community Hospital has one of the lower infection rates in the state and is lower than the national average. Um, and my, my own personal hands is, is even lower than that. Um, so I think it's an excellent facility uh, to consider, um, but nothing is risk-free, unfortunately. COVID protocol, I suppose we still talk about COVID because it's out there somewhere or everywhere. Um, we have been doing elective surgeries since April of 2020. Um, we no longer actually have patients that have to get um, COVID tests before surgery, uh, but the staff still does follow our proper PPE protocols. Um, and so it's been very safe. Uh, we've been doing this for more than two years now, uh, almost three years, um, and patients have been doing very well. So um, I don't think you should be concerned yourself um, with COVID at this time. Um, and there is not a, a need to test unless you're symptomatic uh, before the surgery. At this time, I'd like to open it up for questions and thank you all for your time this evening. Thank you so much, Dr. Blackwood. That was very informative. And we want to remind our viewers that you can submit your questions in the chat box below the video, and we'll get to as many as we can tonight. I'm going to dive right in with uh, some of these knee questions uh, to start out with. Uh, this person says that they're a runner and they want to be reminded how long until they can resume running after a knee replacement. So that's a good question. So how long until you can resume running after a knee replacement? My answer is going to be the same, which is I don't recommend that people run after a knee replacement. Um, I will be honest, there have been some studies out showing, you know, comparing patients who do what we tell them and patients who don't do what we tell them, and there hasn't been a huge difference in the longevity of the implants or the components, but you have to think logically, and that's where we're sort of basing this on, that these are man-made implements that we're putting in there, uh, man-made replacements, and they are metal and plastic, and they have wear rates, and they can wear out. So it's not advised to run and jump after joint replacements. I always tell people if someone's chasing you, run away. 
if a car's coming at you, jump out of the way. Uh, but we don't necessarily recommend you return to running as a, a normal activity. Um, that being said, I'm also not going to follow you around and write you a ticket or you know, tap you on the shoulder until you're being naughty. Um, you're an adult, so if you understand the risks, um, I'm not going to advise or recommend you return to running, but you are free to make your own choices. So kind of to tag on to uh, what you mentioned there, uh, that these are man-made devices that you're putting in and they don't last forever. Um, how long do they last, both for the knee and the hip? That is a good question. So how long do these things last? So I think there's a 90% chance they last 20 years. I think there's a good chance that they last 30. Um, in the lab, they actually state that these things can last 100 years. I try not to use lab material to, to quote for longevity for real patients, but there has been marked improvement in the materials and how they wear and how they last. Um, and so we, we hope that this is all that you need. Um, but if you are 50 years old, um, there's about a 50% chance you may need to have a second surgery down the road. Um, and ideally, it's just the plastic that wears out. But there, if the plastic wears out enough, sometimes you need to actually replace the remainder of the, the joint as well, because then that can loosen the implant from the bone. <clears throat> Uh, but in general, these are lasting much longer, and so that's the 90%, you know, 20 years, good chance of 30. And so what are the replacement equipment parts made of, and do any include nickel? That is a good question. So what are these components made of? The hip components are made of titanium on the metal side, and then a ceramic ball. There also exists a cobalt chrome ball, um, but we don't routinely use that. Almost everyone uses a ceramic. And so there is no nickel in a hip. On the knee side, the base plate that goes on the tibia or the shin bone is made of titanium. Uh, and then the <clears throat> thigh bone or that really shiny piece of metal that goes on there is made of cobalt chrome. There is a trace amount of nickel in there. Uh, and so if patients do have a nickel allergy, there are alternative uh, implants that we can use that don't have nickel or are ceramicized metal. <clears throat> and so we cannot use the robot with those systems, uh, but we can use those with manual instrumentation uh, for a knee replacement. And so if patients have an allergy to nickel, we have a, an option for that and a solution for that as well. And there are a handful of people in, in Boulder who have that nickel allergy. So is part of your um, pre-op procedure to do testing um, for metal allergies? So <clears throat> preoperatively, do we do testing? We do not do routine testing. Unfortunately, there's not a very simple test for that. Uh, so our first line is just to ask patients if they're allergic to metal. Uh, so we ask your allergies. Most people, by the time they meet me, have lived 60 or 70 years and understand that there's certain you know, cheap jewelry or certain things they can't wear, so they know they may have an, an aversion to nickel. If they're concerned about it, there is a test that we can send off for. It's about five or $600, and it's a blood test that we send to Chicago. So that can be done, and that can give us information on all the metals that we use, including possibly cements. Um, and, but you know, unfortunately, that's not covered by insurance, and so uh, we don't routinely send that off for testing. OK, that's good to know. This person is asking, should they exhaust all non-surgical options before considering replacement, or does an MRI tell all? Uh, that's a good question. So should you exhaust non-operative measures, or would an MRI give more information? Uh, in general, you want to try to be cognizant and utilize non-operative measures as long as they're working. So you know, if, you, if the over-the-counter medicines work, great. Um, if the injections work, great. If you want to try different injections, I think that's a good idea. If one injection doesn't work, it does make it a little less likely that another type of injection may not work either. Um, and so it depends a little bit on how bad the pain is, how bad the x-rays look like. Um, an MRI can offer some information um, that's, that's going on, uh, but usually we reserve sort of an MRI being a decider if a patient has exhausted the non-operative measures, but the x-rays are still not convincing that they need to have a knee replacement, so there's not bone on bone on the x-ray. So get an MRI to get a closer look at the, the soft tissue and make sure that we're not missing something inside the knee. 
And that can often show us um, enough wear and tear that, that a, a knee replacement is justified, uh, but we don't make necessarily um, decisions based on just an MRI or use that as our ultimate decider. Uh, we try to combine the exam, the patient's history, what they've done, and what the x-rays look like. And really, it's only rarely we get an MRI in a joint replacement setting. Thank you. Can we talk about cost? What's the cost for treatment if you don't have insurance? That's a good question. So uh, that is fair since I discussed the cost of how much some of these different injections are. Um, the cost for uh, if you don't have insurance, um, is variable based on where you have the surgery. Um, so I think it's at the hospital somewhere twenty-five to thirty thousand uh, dollars, and at the surgery center twenty-two to twenty-five thousand um, dollars. And then you know that may just be for the actual facility fee. So um, the actual place where you have surgery gets paid substantially more than what I do to do the surgery. Um, my out-of-pocket cost is probably. 10 to 20% of what a hospital gets paid. Um, and so <clears throat> that's, uh, it's all together. We are working on sort of a bundled uh, payment plan for people who don't have insurance. Um, I think it's called Save MD uh, that BCH is working on. Um, and so Boulder Community Health would be a good place to touch base with that. Um, or at our facility, our office, and discussing with the surgery center um, to figure out what the cost differences are for those. Um, if it's covered by insurance, um, it usually takes care of your deductible for the year. So um, we'll have a lot of people who get joints replaced at the end of the year because they've hit their deductible uh, or at the beginning of the year because they want to hit their deductible. And then that carries them through the rest of the year um, for any other medical care they may need. Okay. Will you recap if there are any downsides to the hyaluronic acid treatments? So that's a good question. So is there any downside to the hyaluronic acid injections? Um, the biggest downside is that they may not work um, and that it is three injections instead of one injection um, or five injections or rarely we do have, there are formulations that are just one injection. Unfortunately, it's a lot of medicine to put in at one time um, and it does seem to have a higher chance for the joint to react to it or the person to react to it. Um, if people have allergies to it, that can be a problem. Um, or anytime you break the skin, there's obviously a risk of infection. Um, the other downside is after joint injections, uh, for cortisone you want to wait 6 to 12 weeks from an injection to having a joint replaced. And then, oddly enough, for the hyaluronic acid, that's at least 12 weeks from the injection to joint replacement uh, due to the increased risk of uh, infection after both of those types of injections. This person is asking about what do you do? They say everything hurts. So how do you determine whether it's the hip or the knee or both? That's a good question. So how do we determine what's causing the pain and what the issue is? Um, there are people who have knee pain that's actually coming from their hip. There are people who have hip pain where it's coming from their back. Um, and so that's where we try to have you come into the clinic. Um, we wanna get x-rays of the, the joints that are hurting do exams of those joints. So um, if the knee hurts and the hip has a good range of motion, it's unlikely to be the hip that's causing the knee pain. Um, if it's a clean knee x-ray, but the hip is very stiff, then it may be the hip that's causing the knee pain. Um, there are people walking around who've had both hips and both knees replaced by me. So um, it is possible to have more than one thing go wrong at the same time. Um, and there are also people who've had spine surgery after a hip replacement or before a hip replacement. Um, because they have more than one thing going on. So um, hopefully we try to differentiate what is the biggest pain driver and address that first. Um, but an exam and discussion, a history, and then imaging uh, and x-rays are very helpful for identifying the causes of the pain. Um, for a person who has, uh, is needing surgery on both needs, do you recommend getting the surgery done uh, at once or to do it separately and if separately how long between each one? That's a good question. So uh, how long in between joint replacements uh, would you recommend if you need to have two done or would you recommend doing two at the same time? Um, I do not recommend doing two at the same time. I think that you need to have a good leg to stand on so I think you need to have the help and recovery that way. 
Um, and there's more risk in doing two joints at the same time. Uh, there's actually pretty good evidence that it's falling out of favor and not a great idea. There are some people who the risk of anesthesia is higher than the risk of the joint replacements at the same time. And so if they really desperately need to get in to have them both replaced at the same time so that they can have just one anesthetic and recovery, um, then that is something that can be discussed. But in general, for most people, 99% of people, I recommend spacing the surgeries out six to 12 weeks. So we have patients who do both knees or both hips spaced out six weeks apart. But whether it's six weeks, six months, or six years is up to you as far as the interval you want in between um, and how recovered you want to be. Realizing that you won't be fully recovered at six weeks, but you should be recovered enough to go uh, and have the other side done. Um, spacing them out also allows you to focus your recovery at one joint at a time. So you're able to really work and have better outcomes, I think, after the surgery uh, when you do them staged rather than if you do them at the same time. Okay. Um, to see you, do, that, do people need a, a referral from their primary care provider or how do they uh, go about seeing you? Um, so people can uh, call the, the number here that we have. Um, they can go to the website for either my practice or my own personal website. Um, they can make an appointment directly. Um, it depends on insurance, whether they need to have a referral or not, uh, because that's more of an insurance thing. So if you have a, an HMO or somebody where they, they require you to have a referral before you can go see a specialist, um, then you may need to have a referral on that level. Um, but otherwise, you know, we're still accepting new patients. Um, I do both hip and knee replacements. Um, there was a rumor floating around for a while that I had given up one or the other, uh, but I have not. <laughs> I'm still, still doing hip and knee replacements. Um, uh, and it's pretty easy to, to get in to see myself. Um, and if I'm booked out a little while, uh, my um, PA and, and wife, Cheryl, is, is somebody who can assist you as well. And uh, sometimes that's a, a sneaky way to get in sooner, to get on the surgery schedule, schedule sooner, uh, because we are usually booking out about four to six weeks for surgery in general, and that stretches out to six to eight weeks uh, at the end of the year. Okay. That was very helpful. Thank you. Um, if you have osteoporosis, can you still get a knee replacement? If you have osteoporosis, can you get a knee replacement? Yes, most of my patients have some level of osteoporosis or osteopenia um, that undergo joint replacement, either a hip or a knee replacement. Um, it may influence what type of fixation we use. So the majority of patients, we have the bone grow onto the implant. Um, but if there's weaker bone or softer bone, we may cement the implant in place, especially in a knee replacement, um, to allow sort of more immediate fixation uh, and that's very durable as well. Okay. For knees, what do you think of the new hydrogel that was recently in the press? Uh, what do I think of the new hydrogel that was recently in the press? Uh, I'm unfamiliar with the specifics of, of that question, unfortunately. Um, you know, I try to keep up uh, to date on lots of uh, information, um, but that one I'm not familiar with off the top of my head. I apologize. No worries. Thank you. Um, for this person, um, they said, the pain's not too bad yet in their hip. It's just annoying like it's there. Um, should they use a topical ointment at this point in time? Uh, and what do you recommend with what ingredients? Uh, good question. So if it's sort of a more mild pain or something that's more annoying, um, I would actually, instead of a topical ointment, because no matter how good they get topically, it's not going to soak into the joint itself. So if you are able to take oral anti-inflammatories, I think that would be better. So whether that's Aleve or ibuprofen, um, you know, prescription Celebrex, Meloxicam, those types of things. Uh, even Tylenol can be helpful. Um, if you're not able to take those anti-inflammatories because of kidney issues or you're on a blood thinner, um, that's when we sort of try and push for those topical um, creams and things to go. Uh, and in that case, we usually try to recommend people use that Voltaren gel that's over the counter now. Um, and so that way they don't need a prescription for that. Okay. <clears throat> Is there the same downside to delaying hip replacement in the same way that there is for knee replacement? Uh, is there the same downside for delaying the joint replacement? Yes, that was not just for knee replacement, that was for hip replacement as well. Um, you know, you don't want to dig yourself such a big hole that it takes a long time to dig out of. 
Um, and so, yes, that was more of a generic discussion on joint replacements in general, not specific to just knees. So similar for hips. Okay. Are there better candidates for TKA than others? Are there better candidates for total knees than others? Uh, of course. I mean, so um, some people are healthier than others. Some people have more obvious disease and a more straightforward course than others. Um, but you know, not everybody is, is super healthy. Um, ideal in an age range where the average age is 67, but you know, people go up to 80 or even 90 um, for surgeries. And so um, some people are not perfect health candidates, um, but that doesn't mean they can't have surgery. Uh, we just wanna make sure it's smart and that their risk benefit uh, discussion is had and that they've talked with their regular doctor, talked with the anesthesiologist, talked with the cardiologist if they need to and see sort of make sure everybody has a a team decision making on what the risks are and, and how beneficial it's gonna be for the patients. Okay. How frequently does the ball slip out of the socket? How frequently does the ball slip out of the socket? Uh, luckily, not very often. Um, it's less than 1% um, with an anterior approach. Um, it's one to 2%, um, sometimes higher with a posterior approach. So um, it's very rare that that happens. That's good. <laughs> I've heard uh, cobalt implants can cause cancer. Any thoughts? Um, so if you've been to California before, you know that anything can cause cancer because they have cancer warnings on the parking lots. Um, so anything that is in an excessive amount in your body or, or something could cause uh, a cancer. Um, when we discuss how that works, it's not when it, in a knee replacement and rubbing against the plastic, it's a very inert uh, substance. So it's not just straight cobalt, it's cobalt chromium. So it's a combination of the metal that, that is very shiny and very tough and durable. Um, so it's not leaching out into your body the whole time. Um, when we see those metal on metal hip replacements where there was cobalt chrome rubbing against cobalt chrome, then that would release cobalt and chromium ions. Um, but those in and of themselves don't necessarily cause cancer. Um, what they would cause was something called a pseudo tumor. Um, so it was a growth that was, you know, very dramatic, but not necessarily cancerous. So I'm not saying that things can't cause cancer. I'm saying that there are millions of people out in the world with knee replacements, and there is not an epidemic of joint replacement induced cancers. Okay. After hip replacement, how soon can this person walk upstairs? So uh, how long before you can walk upstairs? Uh, it's the same for both a hip and knee replacement. So um, if it can even be as soon as the same day um, to have people go up and down stairs. Um, you're going to do it controlled and with uh, you know, a crutch or with the railing. Um, and you sort of go up with the good leg. And then when you come down, you put the, down leg, the bad leg down first. So up with the good, down with the bad. One step at a time, so it's not quick. Um, but that's the, the general consensus. So you, you can definitely do that before you go home whether it's same day or next day. That's pretty quickly. Uh, this is fairly specific. Can anterior be done in a fractured hip with a break below the femoral head? Uh, can anterior be done with a broken femoral neck? Um, yes, yeah, so depends on where the fem femur bone is broken. If it's sort of a it's termed a hip fracture where the ball part is broken off of the, the neck of the femur, um, that's a very common approach in surgery that's done um, for a total hip replacement. Um, we did that on Monday. We do it on occasion um, when patients fall and break their hip. Um, so it's not everyone does it that way, but that's uh, in that what type of fracture I'm envisioning. It's a very, very common option to do that for an anterior approach. Okay. Since arthritis is progressive, do you risk having to have another knee surgery later if you only do a partial knee replacement? That's a good question. So that is one of the risks of a partial knee replacement as opposed to a total knee replacement is that there is remaining normal tissue that's left behind. So when I talk about arthritis being progressive, it's sort of like it grows out from where the wear and tear is. And so if we go in and fix the worn out portion, whether that's the inside or under the kneecap or the outside, the remaining knee is good and healthy, um, and there is a chance that it could wear out, but we're able to align it so that it lines up and wears more on the, the new portion, uh, the replaced portion, 
than on the native or natural portion. Um, and so we try to reduce the chances that it can wear out, um, but that is a possibility. Uh, in general, we try not to do partial knee replacements in inflammatory arthritis, where the body is going to continue to attack the whole joint, and that's we reserve more for total knee replacement. Um, but if there's sort of an isolated disease, it's again sort of like the cavity. You feel the cavity and it doesn't mean the rest of the tooth goes bad, although you can get cavities in the same tooth. This person is in their 60s. They're about 100 pounds overweight. They're asking if it would be better to lose weight before the surgery or to have the surgery so they can increase mobility in order to lose the weight. That's a good question about whether the, the before and after for the weight loss. Um, there have been some studies that show that if people have surgery before, they actually don't lose the weight. Um, so we try to encourage people to lose whatever weight they can because that's where the benefit comes in is losing the weight before surgery to reduce your risk of blood clots, reduce your risk of infections, pneumonias, um, and complications around the time of surgery. It depends on what that 100 pounds is and how tall you are. Um, if you're 5'1", you know, 100 pounds is probably going to put you well over that 40 BMI cutoff um, that we sort of have a soft ceiling on. Um, if you're 6'2", 100 pounds may not put you over that 40 BMI cutoff. Um, it kind of depends on where the weight is. Um, you know, trying to lose it beforehand is probably in general better, um, but I do agree sometimes it's difficult to get around and move, um, and so, you know, the joint replacement can help with the mobility, uh, but in general, studies have kind of shown that it, it doesn't actually bear out that way. Okay. Not that it can't. So regarding total knee replacement recovery, do you have a maximum length of time to prescribe opiates? This person thinks opiates are the most helpful. Uh, so there is a reason we give you the narcotics or the opiates. Um, they do help sort of to, to get through the pain. They don't take the pain away, but they make you tolerate the pain better. Um, we usually have patients that are off of their narcotics uh, after a couple weeks from surgery. Um, we have a firm cutoff of unless there's an issue or specifics um, at six weeks after surgery um, because those are addictive things. We don't want you to be addicted to these medicines or develop an addiction. Um, and that's how that happened years ago was people just continued to give out narcotics because it was easier to just say yes when people were having pain uh, to give them more meds uh, than to actually sort of figure out what was going on or try to be firm and say you don't need this anymore. Because if you take it for longer than about six weeks, your brain starts to like it and then it makes you have more pain or feel more pain. So it actually adjusts the, the switchboard in your brain that says, oh, uh, I feel the knee now. I need some more of this pill. The knee's really bothering me. I need this pill. Um, whether or not it's actually causing pain or whether there's actually an issue. So um, we are smart about how we do use the narcotics. They're powerful medicines. Um, we try not to be stingy with it or make people suffer, um, but we have firm cutoffs as to when you should be done with the, the narcotics. Good to know. Wanted to give you a shout out from this uh, person. They said they watched a robotic robotic video on YouTube, but uh, there's been so much more in this uh, lecture and more personal, and they wanted to thank you for that. Oh, good. I'm glad people are enjoying the, the talk and the conversation, and it can be a little dry at times, but we try to have a little humor. It's also a little awkward giving a, a talk to a nearly empty room when there used to be lots of people sitting here and, and getting some feedback. Um, I think we had uh, almost 700 people signed up for the surgery or for the talk today, so... Um, I hope people are, are getting what they getting some good information out of it. Okay, we still have um, a few more questions. Quite a few. Uh, we'll get to as many as we can here. Um, are there situations where the posterior hip replacement is preferred over anterior? That's a good question. So, is there situations where posterior is better than anterior? It's rare, but it's usually based on morphology of the patient. So. If a person has a big belly um, that kind of hangs down over their thighs, um, then that covers the area where we want to make that incision. And it's not so much that it covers it, but that skin is usually not very good and it's moist and doesn't heal very well. Um, and so it increases your risk for infection. Um, I've had a couple times where we've tried to push the envelope a little bit and had kind of regretted it because there can be some, some infections that can develop there. Um, so in those instances, we sort of think of a side or a posterior approach can be better. 
Um, if there's certain hardware in the hip, um, it may be better to go in and, and take that out uh, from a posterior approach. Um, and then uh, if there's certain revision surgeries or second time surgeries, um, can be better performed from a posterior approach. So it's definitely not something that we need to get rid of, um, but I think the vast majority of patients uh, do better with an anterior approach. That doesn't mean that patients don't do well with a posterior um, if needed to, to do that. Okay. What do you do if you have arthritis and pain in both your hips and your knees? It's a good question. So what if uh, both your hips and both your knees are worn out? Um, you know, if you've sort of exhausted the non-operative measures, so the, the injections and whether it's in the hip or in the knee, um, you know, then you kind of decide which one hurts worse. So if all things are equal and they're both worn out, hips and knees, we usually start at the top and work our way down. So replace the hips and then replace the knees. Uh, but if the knees hurt worse than the hips, you can definitely replace the, the knee first and then go to the hip. Um, there's not a, not a set rule of thumb, but um, if all things are equal, we usually do the hips and then the knees uh, rather than vice versa. Okay. Um, so this person has a friend who had the hip surgery, and now his legs are different lengths. Um, is that common? Why does that happen? Can you avoid that? Uh, so it's a good question. So uh, one of the risks that we talked about um, in the slide on that was that there are risks of changing the length of the leg. Um, and that's less with an anterior approach, it's less with the robotics, uh, but it's not zero. So we try to do the best that we can um, with hip replacements. So uh, we try to get rid of the joint and put in the new metal and plastic um, cup and liner, and that helps get rid of the pain. And then our second goal is to make it stable. So we wanna make it so that the hip is not dislocating. In doing so, sometimes we sacrifice our third goal, uh, which is to try to match up the leg lengths as best we can. So it's possible that at the time of surgery your friend had, uh, they needed to lengthen the leg a little bit for stability of the hip joint. Um, and so by doing an anterior approach, there seems to be less of that when combined with robotics um, to adjust the length of the legs. Sometimes people are trying to increase the length of the legs because it's starting so much shorter and it can feel quite dramatic initially. Um, but we try to sort of match up what each patient needs um, with the actual surgery and the outcomes. But our main goal is pain, relief, stability, and then leg length. Okay. Can you break your hip after having a replacement? Can you break your hip after having a replacement? You don't break the hip, but you can break that thigh bone around the stem, um, and that can be complicated to put back together. So. Um, usually we try to have patients take it easy for six to eight weeks afterwards because it takes six to eight weeks for the bone to grow on. Um, or unfortunately, at basically any time if you fall hard enough um, in an activity, the most dramatic of which was a woman who was pumping gas and her car got hit while she was pumping gas and she broke the bone around the stem. The metal parts won't break, but the bone around it can, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, does supplemental... Medicare cover this or most of the cost? It's a good question. So usually Medicare covers 80% and then the supplement usually covers the rest or close to the rest, um, depending on the, the plan. This one says uh, that when listening to the lecture, they said sometimes it's better to get a full or partial knee replacement sooner rather than later. Can you uh, explain that, discuss that a little bit more? Sure. Um, it's sort of what we've mentioned before. You, you don't necessarily have to put it off until you can't stand it anymore. You don't have to put it off until the, you've exhausted all non-operative measures. You don't want to jump right into it. Um, you want to try to, you know, try some non-operative things first. I will often get patients where I recommend them not have surgery when they've been recommended surgery before. Um, but, you know, if you have surgery sooner, you're usually in younger, um, obviously. Uh, you're usually in better condition or, or better shape, um, and you bounce back from the surgery a little better rather than being uh, further debilitated from the, the hip or knee arthritis. Okay. Uh, 